Good, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone enjoyed lunch and the uh, government networking session. Uh, my name is Tim Heidel. I'm one of the program directors here at ARPA-E. Uh, the sessions this afternoon, this one and, and the other concurrent sessions, um, are they're, they're a bit of fun for us, actually. Um, the prompt we've been given is we have six minutes and six minutes alone to pitch you on an idea or a program or a piece of technology that, of interest. The idea is to try and talk about potential areas where each of us have interest, um, either in a future program at ARPA-E or an area that we think ARPA-E should consider investing in. Um, each of us are going to have six minutes to give our pitch, and then we'll have some moderated Q&A for another 20 minutes or so, um, and we will try our absolute best to leave some time at the end for individual discussions with uh, the program directors and fellows who are up here. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to how do we go back? Um, I will turn it over to Joe Cornelius to uh, kick us off. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Joe Cornelius, and as Tim had alluded to, this is an opportunity for us to actually lay out <clears throat> very quickly some ideas that we're currently mulling around internally about a potential new program. And the first program that we're, that we're going to pitch here, which um, I'll present, is uh, biology-based. Um, I am a physiologist, and <clears throat> what I specifically want to talk about is a pitch around carbon sequestration. Uh, you're familiar, most of you are, are familiar with Petro and Terra as two uh, FOAs that are currently, uh, one is uh, uh, winding down, one's winding up. This would be a, a, a third potential area that we would want to consider uh, moving into. So <clears throat> why plants? Well, <clears throat> the plants are basically the big horse on the block. And when you look at CO2 emissions on an annual basis, um, a lot of the amount of uh, CO2 that is measured within the atmosphere is a direct reflection of how productive plants are in the biosphere. This actually reflects the peak period <clears throat> during the late winter months uh, during which uh, the plants have not been actively photosynthesizing. If you take the same snapshot, look at it in August, late summer, now in the Northern Hemisphere, we've had significant amount of biomass uh, capturing CO2 from the atmosphere. You can see that plants do a fabulous job of actually cleaning up a lot of that CO2. <clears throat> and there's a very clear annual um, flux when we look at uh, CO2 sequestration or CO2 capture. During the fall and winter, we see CO2 increasing when we don't have quite as many plants uh, photosynthesizing. Then in the summer, we see a significant decrease uh, as we go from spring to summer as plants reach their, uh, their peak productivity. Productivity from a photosynthetic standpoint is dominated very much by uh, the uh, temperate uh, forest and grasslands in the northern hemisphere and tropical rainforest and savannas in the southern hemisphere. And if we look at the carbon cycle, it's uh, very complex, but I want to point to a couple very uh, key points on this particular slide. Human activity is generating approximately nine gigatons of CO2 annually. Fortunately, about five of that is being captured in natural processes such as ocean and land uh, systems. But four of that CO2 is, is being put into the atmosphere, and it's essentially um, irreversible once it reaches that particular stage. So as we look at the plant biosphere, which is the horse in this race, <clears throat> the biosphere is, is processing or fluxing 120 gigatons on average of CO2. As, you, as we cascade through all the different biological processes, at the end of the year, we end up with approximately three gigatons that end up in uh, permanently fixed within the soil uh, biosphere. On a U.S. basis, that would look like about 20.25 gigatons. So the aspiration, how do we double the CO2 capture within this uh, existing biosphere in the soil? And as a reference point, the U.S. transportation um, sector emits about a half a gigaton of CO2, of carbon. So if we were to increase from 0.25 to 0.5, that would be um, basically a, uh, it would match what we're currently emitting from transportation. So why plants? Why the U.S.? Well, the U.S. actually has 
the distinct advantage of having 75% of our landscape in some of the most productive uh, soil on the planet. We have over 600 million acres of forest. Put that into visual perspective, that's the size of the four largest states, uh, Alaska, Texas, Ca um, uh, California, and Montana. We also have a significant amount of grassland, cropland, all of which are contributing on an annual basis to soil organic carbon. We're sitting on a reserve of about 72 gigatons in that soil, and there's a significant engine here that we could harness to actually increase that uh, substantially, an engine that we have not thoroughly or even uh, uh, remotely begun to, to mine aggressively. So as we look at from a U.S. standpoint, not surprisingly, we're looking at stocks on the right uh, of CO2 or carbon stocks. Uh, most of those are concentrated in the grasslands of the Midwest or in the uh, terrestrial forests of the, of the uh, Pacific Northwest or the Southeast. So what are high impact areas of opportunity? In this particular slide, it represents a, a paper by Tuscan's group at um, Oak Ridge. And basically, there are a number of different areas that are ripe for us to actually go after aggressively. Uh, improved uh, crop tolerance, uh, improved photosynthesis, carbon allocation to roots, increased uh, recalcitrance, all of which um, have significant opportunities for us to improve the amount of carbon that is being sequestered long term. These four opportunities represent about uh, six gigatons on an annual basis that are, have a potential for us to, to pursue. And if we look at particular technical fields of interest, obviously roots are where it happens. Roots are the interface between the plant and the soil uh, microenvironment. They're the scavengers for water. And subsequently, <clears throat> looking at uh, particular technologies that would allow us to enhance root architecture, carbon partitioning of soil uh, organic matter, and rhizosphere uh, development would all be particular interest. So <clears throat> in summary, our sequestration uh, objective would be to double soil organic carbon, uh, by, <clears throat> which would allow us to mitigate uh, U.S. transportation by acceler accelerating genetic selection in plants with cutting edge tools and technologies. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Paula Burtis. I'm a fellow here at RPE. And I'm going to highlight some of the diversity of what we work on and move to a topic that's pretty much totally different than what Joe just spoke about. And in particular, I'm going to talk about exciting opportunities that we see in, um, in solid ion conductors. So um, chemical reactions and the materials that are transformed in chemical reactions are energy currency. And if we look at a whole diversity of uh, energy materials that we know are important, we can see that there's different phases, gases, solids, and liquids, and also a large um, diversity of chemical reactivities. And these materials are transformed in different chemical reactions like separation processes, uh, chemical synthesis, batteries, fuel cells, and other processes. And it's important to note that all these processes, at least in principle, can be carried out electrochemically. And that's important because it allows us to couple these reactions with electrons, and eventually those electrons can come from clean energy sources like solar or wind. But there's a missing piece in that scheme, and that missing piece is the center part, and that's the ion conducting layer. And so <clears throat> we need a way to get ions between these two different chemical half reactions to complete that scheme. And uh, solids are actually the most versatile way of doing this. And the reason is that, um, for example, we can see above, there's all these different phases like solids, liquids, and gases. And only a solid layer, uh, a solid ion conducting layer, can block any of those different phases from basically um, moving through that uh, center layer and shorting off those two different half reactions. Solids can off also offer good chemical stability and mechanical integrity. So let's talk about how this basic scheme can have a quantitative impact on our mission areas. So if we apply um, solid ion conducting layers in the form of this electrochemical cell to um, energy storage, we can help <coughs> excuse me, solar and wind reach more than 20% penetration into the grid. If we apply this to um, distributed generation, we can help to utilize some of the 60 quads of thermal energy that are currently wasted. That would be, for example, an in-home fuel cell that did combined heat and power. If we apply it to electric vehicles and fuel cells, we could help to reduce some of the 16 quads of oil that are currently used to power our light-duty vehicles. And so these are big numbers, and we can see the importance of this enabling material class. Now, this is a story about mass transport. And I think all of us have mass transport intuitions from our everyday experience. Uh, one good post-lunch example, uh, if you walk into a room with a plate of cookies, 
you can smell them very quickly. So we have a sense immediately that, that um, gas phase transport is fast. Liquid phase transport, not quite as fast. And solid phase transport, we think of as being slowest of all. You have to soak beans overnight to get a significant amount of water into those structures. And so when we hear about solid ion conducting layers, we think, oh, that's going to be slow. But as in so many cases in chemistry and material science, our intuitions don't necessarily apply to the exceptional cases. And that's exactly what we have um, in solid ion conductors. In particular, there's a class of materials called fast solid ion conductors, which actually transport like liquids, even though they're solids. And let me give you one example of that. Here I'm showing you ionic conductivity versus temperature. And um, the conductivity, which is basically the transport rate, mass transfer rate um, for liquids at 25 degrees Celsius is shown in that blue band. And a standard material like sodium chloride, until it melts, has a very low conductivity. Once it melts, it enters a molten or liquid state and then has a significant conductivity. However, um, other materials, so for example, silver iodide is one of the classic materials, actually undergoes a solid-solid phase transition from the beta phase to the alpha phase at about 420 Kelvin. And um, even before it melts, it is a solid that can conduct as fast as a liquid can. And the reason this happens really comes down to crystal structure and atomic arrangement. And in the case of silver iodide, what happens is the silver sublattice basically melts, and you have a, a large um, uh, number, high mobility and large number of channels for, for mass transfer through the iodide lattice. So this is not a new area. Um, solid ion conductors have been around for a very long time, since at least Michael Faraday that we've known about them. And um, what are some technical opportunities that we at RPE see in this area? One example would be in nanostructuring. Basically, as you reduce the domain side, size of a solid ion conductor, the interfacial properties come to be as important as bulk properties. And there's some cases where um, there's enhanced mass transfer in the interfaces compared to the bulk. And there's a very clear example of this um, in calcium fluoride and barium fluoride heterolayers. Another example is in computational materials discovery. The idea here is to solve for electronic structure of materials in a computer and then only synthesize and test a much smaller number. And that's a way of enhancing that rate at which you can discover and develop new materials. Uh, third example is in composite layers. Um, basically, you can combine two different materials that have properties individually that are insufficient, but when combined, um, those properties are complementary and can lead to improved performance. And this is an example from um, an oxide uh, conducting uh, composite. And finally, just new compositions. And I want to highlight this case of this lithium conducting material here uh, as a, a particularly exciting recent example of work in this area. So here I'm uh, just like to make the point that uh, even after quite a long time in this field, uh, there's new compositions that continue to be discovered. So here I'm showing you lithium conductivity at 25 degrees C, so all this is at room temperature. And again, I'm showing you conductivity, ionic conductivity on the y-axis. And if we look at the history of developments in this area over the past uh, 40 years or so, keeping in mind that our benchmark for organic liquid electrolytes is about 10 to the minus 2, 1 over ohm centimeters, you can see that up until about 2010, no one had made a material that had the same con conductivity in the solid phase as a liquid phase at room temperature. But just in the past couple of years, we've gotten actually two new materials um, that I show you here that are actually, even at room temperature, can conduct lithium better in the solid phase and the liquid phase. And so just to uh, conclude, I'd like to say that um, we see solid ion conducting layers as being both impactful for emission areas and also having significant technical opportunities that uh, we'd like to explore. Thank you. Jason. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason Rugolo. I'm a program director at RPE. Uh, shifting gears again, uh, no pun intended, I'm going to talk about a unified transportation and electricity infrastructure. So what do I mean by that? So this is a picture of a parking lot, right? It's a bunch of cars. They're all just sitting there, right? They're not doing anything for us. In fact, we drive, what, one, two hours a day, and the other 22, 23, our cars just sit there. So the concept is, why don't we plug them in? Okay, and what I mean by that is we have a power plant on board that is producing shaft power, and that can, that's what electric power plants do, right? So can we figure out a way to use our vehicles, the capital which has already been spent, uh, to, to make electricity for us? It's not that crazy of an idea. So it's a Chevy Volt. Uh, there's 87,000 have been sold. They each have a 55 kilowatt generator on board. Okay, it's a lot of power. 
if you multiply those two numbers together, you get almost five gigawatts. So just the Chevy Volt fleet uh, in, in the United States is the largest power plant. Okay, it's highly distributed, but it's bigger than, you know, Palo Verde in Arizona. So just want to make the point that there's a lot of power in the automobile fleet. So this is a typical engine. It's a, it's a big one. It's a V8 Corvette LS1, 350 horsepower. That's 260 kilowatts. Okay, so it, one megawatt wind turbine and 20 to 30 percent capacity factor is about the same power as this engine. We all know how big a one megawatt wind turbine is. So if you, this, I've plotted here U.S. fleet power capacity over time. And in 1975, it was something like 13 terawatts. Now it's 40 terawatts. Okay, that's a huge number. We only use 457 gigawatts of electricity. Right? We have about a terawatt capacity, a um, lot from coal, gas, nuclear, other renewables. Uh, it's something like 4,000 terawatt hours a year. Divide by the number of hours in a year and you get something like 457 gigawatts continuous. So 1% of the shaft power capacity in our vehicles means, uh, producing electricity means no more power plants. Okay, so in, in the vehicle fleet we could obviate the need uh, for power plants. And I mean no more of these massive infrastructure projects, right? They're, they cost a billion dollars, they're massively centralized, they last for a long time after we build them, right? So it's hard to retire these things. My, my main point is they're redundant, right? We already have all this capital out there that does basically the same job. So I, I hope there are red flags going off and you're thinking, wait, gasoline for electricity? That's not what I'm saying. So gasoline is way too expensive as a primary fuel. Um, it would be 48 cents a kilowatt hour with a Chevy Volt, uh, but natural gas is very cheap. So a lot of people have heard of natural gas vehicles. Um, basically, it, it, I've plotted here gas to electric versus natural gas cost is a contour plot. So the lines are lines of constant electricity cost. Uh, so the red dot, right now Henry Hub is below $3. Right? It's too nice. If we have $3 per million BTU gas, and you go up to 30 to 40% conversion efficiency, you're right between the two and three cent per kilowatt hour contours. Okay, so we're talking about less than three cents a kilowatt hour electricity coming from these vehicles. Of course, they'd have to be hybrid natural gas vehicles, and so this is getting to the research challenges. It turns out that semi-trucks alone could do the job for us. Uh, we have nearly three million semi-trucks. They're about 300 kilowatts a piece. It's 825 gigawatts, roughly, of semi-truck shaft power out there. 55% uh, of the time generating, they could, they could make all of our electricity. That's 13 hours a day. It turns out they, that they can only drive, a driver can only drive for 10 hours a day. Right, so we have 14 hours that these things are parked. Um, this is a truck stop I pulled off the internet. The 16 trucks here is about five megawatts. Okay, these trucks can't be plugged in, but if you had a hybrid tractor, they could. Right? So here's a futuristic vehicle. Uh, it's a, called the Wave Concept. It was built by Peterbilt and Walmart. It has a capstone microturbine. Something like this could be plugged in. Right? This one is not natural gas, but it could be relatively easily. In fact, we have a truck from Oshkosh in the showcase you guys will be able to see. It has 120 kilowatts of utility-grade exportable power. Okay, so this is being done. This thing can power a whole forward military base. So the big question is, is it possible to make a natural gas hybrid tractor, semi-truck, cost-effectively? And what do I mean by cost-effectively? Uh, there are a lot of parts, right? So there's tanks, motors, turbo machinery, perhaps an internal combustion engine, batteries for the hybridization, balance of plant. All that stuff has to work together to make a vehicle system that pays back on industry timescales. Those timescales are two to three years, so it's a really hard problem. And the second question is, this works, how do we plug in and manage three million moving gensets? Okay, all of a sudden we go from thousands of power plants to three million, right? And that's a really tough problem. So here's a crazy idea, Uber for electricity generation. All right, so instead of taxi cabs, they're semi-trucks driving around. They all know their capacity. Um, on the, on the right-hand side here, I've plotted, plotted a uh, Midwest ISO locational marginal price map, which shows the, the price of electricity at different points on the Midwest grid. A trucker could get a note on his iPhone that says, hey, pull over, we'll pay you 100 bucks to generate for an hour or something, right? It's one way to manage uh, this infrastructure. So I'm calling this truck to grid. Uh, there are a lot of questions, more questions than answered than answers, um, but here, here's a quick summary of why it might be interesting. Massive savings by eliminating power plants, okay? So it's a capex efficiency idea. Um, you lower the cost of electricity, you don't have to deal with siting issues, these things are already cited, right, for the trucking industry. 
Um, it's Uber distributed generation, no pun intended. I mean Uber as in super distributed generation. Uh, it's robust, terrorist proof. It could contribute to deregulation of the electricity industry, which I think is a good thing. And then natural gas for trucks and electricity. All right, natural gas is great for several reasons. So uh, the, the punchline is that the CapEx savings alone could pay for a zero carbon methane. All right, so this might be a way to get zero carbon electricity for free. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Sonia Glavashke and I'm program director focusing mainly on developing transformational grid control technologies that will integrate large scale distributed energy resources and at the same time enable us to have 50% or more renewables integrated into a grid. Uh, so I will try in these six minutes to, for those of you who are not familiar with grid, quickly run what grid control is all about. But basically, infrastructure in the U.S. has been developed in the first half of the 20th century in a pre-digital era. And primary, uh, we have power, uh, power generation at a bulk central power plant level that can be either renewable or non-renewable, dispatchable or non-dispatchable. And then power is flown through a transmission and distribution network down to the end users. And this has been working fine until things started happening at the bottom. There's a lot of new development in terms of distributed generation storage and uh, smart loads that are being connected at the distribution level of the grid that they're introducing uh, lots of intermittency and lots of variability that management paradigm that we are currently using is not ready for. Uh, so what we would like to uh, address is how can we actually uh, go around this top-down management uh, approach? How can we basically try to tap in all the resources that we have on the grid and run them in a fashion to provide reliability to the grid, but at the same time also uh, do energy savings, reduce CO2 emissions, and uh, that will be done by optimal utilization of distributed resources. And I'll go in more detail in the, in the following slides. But one thing that I want to point out to you, the way how a grid is run today, anything on distribution level is called net load. So difference between uh, the projected load and generation that happens on distribution is called net load, and we dedicate all the power units to make sure that we serve this load. Uh, again, very briefly, reliability of grid depends on balance between power generation and load. So at any point of time, grid operators have to manage that they serve load. And with this intermittency and variability that we are seeing with more renewables, more changes in the usage patterns, for example, electric vehicles that are being plugged in, this task is becoming uh, increasingly difficult. Uh, this picture I'm not going to go into detail, but it's show, showing you that in a, a certain power loss events or transmission line events, this is directly affecting the frequencies. So a lot of uh, activity in the grid management is centered around keeping this frequency in the very tight band around 60, 60 hertz. Uh, this is uh, something that is primarily done by matching central bulk power and net load. And uh, we have looked into some recent studies that basically show us that using the paradigm we are using now, we can at most go to 30% of renewables integrated into, into grid. So we want to uh, aim big, so we are saying, okay, we think that if we can actively control net loads, so all those assets that are on the distribution level, we can get to 50 percent renewable, 50 renewables integrated, or even maybe maybe more. So to make long story short, uh, I am controls person, so I like to control things. And what do I want to control now? Uh, if you look into my bio, I've controlled different things. But basically, what we are doing right now, we are dispatching uh, based on forecasts of the load, a bulk power. Plants, and also we have some uh, demand response programs where we are also dispatching or shedding load. 
What we would like to do is introduce uh, services that net load, so both distributed generation, including storage and flexible load, can provide to the grid to provide so-called ancillary services that are right now provided by central uh, power generation to maintain reliability of the grid. Uh, so what are the technical challenges that we are facing is basically we want to utilize flexibility in a distribution level to affect overall grid performance. And uh, something that doesn't exist right now is the mean how to dispatch both bulk and distributed generation, how to proactively shape loads. There is lots of flexibility that we've seen in the, uh, in the load, how to bring uh, load up when we have extra generation, and how to bring it down when we don't how to coordinate consumers and generation operation, and how to manage heterogeneous loads and distributed energy resources at the same time. Issue here is scale and performing uh, in real time. So RPE uh, tends to uh, bring different technical communities together, and our plan is basically to work with experts from power systems, control systems, uh, distributed systems, and computer, uh, science and utilize all existing sensing, communication technology, uh, data that we are currently collecting, extract the useful information, develop models, and then look into different architectures and algorithms how to control all these assets. And we do believe that some of the critical work will be done in addressing architectures, what needs to be done globally, what needs to be done locally. And that's why uh, I address in my title from local to global. How do we utilize local assets with limited information to achieve optimal performance at the grid level? I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. Um, so again, my name is Tim Heidel. I'm a program director here at RPE. And what you heard from Jason is something I hear quite a bit of. Radical visions for how our electricity system is going to change over the next couple decades. And whether it's trucks or it's wind or it's solar, the way that power is flowing throughout the electricity grid is set to change dramatically. And there's been a number of reports that have said, well, congestion is going to increase quite a bit with that. And so over the last couple of years, ARPA-E has actually been investing in various technologies to overcome congestion in electric transmission networks, whether it's power flow controllers. A lot of our power electronics work for grid scale applications. Uh, we've had teams that have look, been looking at, can we actually find algorithms that will tell us when it's actually best to remove a transmission line from service to overcome congestion? Uh, we've had teams developing algorithms for how would you optimally dispatch energy storage if it were to become cost-effective and ubiquitously deployed. Let me give you a, a sample of what these look like. You saw the one on the right in Cheryl's talk this morning, a magnetic amplifier power flow controller developed by Oak Ridge National Lab. On the left is another flavor. We've actually funded a portfolio of different power flow controller technologies, um, which are all moving towards prototypes and then eventually field demonstrations in the next couple years. Now, if I put one of these devices out on the grid, I can probably figure out how to dispatch it. If I put a couple out on the grid, operators can probably figure out what are the best set points for those devices at any given time. But if I suddenly am deploying fleets of these devices, if they're suddenly deployed at a large number of nodes throughout the, throughout the grid, unfortunately, the truth is our algorithms that we use to operate the grid don't scale that way. And so, to actually enable these devices to help us overcome congestion and optimize and coordinate power flows in the future grid, we need to rethink the core algorithms that we're actually using to actually dispatch the grid. Indeed, what you heard from Sonia is a proposal to radically rethink how can we control and get capability over end-use devices for the purpose of helping us manage the grid. That becomes yet another important controllable resource that these algorithms may have to start to accommodate. So the practice of optimizing grid power flows is part of a class of problems that are known as NP-hard problems for which there is no known exact solution today. What grid operators today are required to do in order to actually balance power every five minutes or every hour or every day is to make very important simplifications 
to help us find feasible solutions within limited sets of time. And that's done routinely and it's been done for 50 years. Those assumptions were absolutely required because when those algorithms were built, we had extremely limited computational power. Now unfortunately, what those simplifications do is they allow us to find solutions and run the grid reliably, but they also leave us in a very conservative place. And none of the algorithms that are used today actually can allow us to fully optimize all of the potential resources that sit out on the grid. Whether it's generator voltage set points, or it's these new controllable power electronics devices, or it's Jason's trucks, we simply don't have the algorithms to be able to manage those devices. Now, even without any of those changes, there's been some examples in the literature recently that have indicated that improved algorithms for solving this problem, it's called the optimal power flow problem, could give us 5 to 10% cost savings in today's grid. 5 to 10% cost savings. Why do I think this is possible? Well, I think there's been five major advances in just the last couple years that finally make it possible that we just might, for the first time, be able to solve this problem fast enough. First, of course, there have been rapid improvements in optimization solvers. The optimization community is applying new methods every single day to a wide variety of different industries. There's also continued reductions in advanced computing costs and the evaluation of alternative problem formulations for this particular problem, and then a whole wide range of new optimization methods. Now, unfortunately, despite all five of these advances over the last couple years, these algorithms are having trouble gaining traction. I really think it comes down to the public data sets that are available to test these new algorithms. I hear from so many teams that say, I've got the best new algorithm and I'm going to solve all your problems. And unfortunately, just don't have a good data set to show that on. And so the real gap here, I believe, is the development of very rigorous, very large scale, realistic, validated data sets that are fully publishable with no sensitive information in them. And then once we have the data set, we also need a platform for actually evaluating different solutions against each other so that we know which solution is best for which attribute of the solution we're looking for. And so for that, I'm proposing that we develop a competition. You build these data sets, you provide these data sets to teams, and they can test whatever algorithm and solution approach they might, come, they might come up with, submit those back to an independent third party for, the, for a full evaluation. Indeed, prizes have been used in a wide variety of different industries and have often brought many people into looking at whatever problem the, the competition's focused on from well outside that traditional community. We don't know yet who's going to come up with the best algorithms to solve this particular problem or which team is going to do that. And so an OPF competition, optimal power flow algorithm competition, might look something like this. We build a very detailed data set of a large scale power system. We also build a set of snapshots, maybe a thousand snapshots. We provide those to teams and they develop all of their algorithms. They then provide the solutions to us or an independent third party for scoring. I really do think that will move us forward to being able to control all of the devices we've been developing over the last five years and all of the radical new visions you've heard today. So thank you. Okay, so we are gonna go into the Q&A session, and uh, I think we've got a couple questions already, but the instructions for how to submit your questions are right on the slide here. And uh, while we have a couple more questions that get, come in, I'll, I'll um, ask some of the first ones that we've seen here. So. Um, First question is to Jason. Jason, a uh, question came in. It, it seems like carbon emissions would go up with your system compared with those that we have today using combined cycle, nat combined cycle natural gas plants. Um, do we really want technology that could make us worse off is the question. So it's a good question. Uh, so a typical vehicle power plant has conversion efficiency between 20 and 40 percent. State of the art uh, natural gas plants are 60 percent efficiency. So the carbon intensity would go up compared to the state of the art. So I guess a couple things. One, the grid mix is something like 32% efficient. So heavy duty trucks already beat that. So it would be an improvement over the grid mix. That's not quite where we want to get to. Um, so the, the major point is that if we get all of our electricity without having to build power plants anymore, right? so there's, there's no capital uh, for electricity anymore, it's just all capital that we've already built, you save a lot of money. Right? And if you could use that money to buy a low-carbon fuel, 
that you could substantially <coughs> reduce, if not completely eliminate, the carbon footprint of electricity generation. So, you know, there are a lot of assumptions that go into efficiency, that go into, uh, you know, the, the life cycle of the low carbon fuel. Is it biomethane? Is it pre-combustion capture of <coughs> carbon from methane? You're burning hydrogen in the truck. I mean, there's a lot of things you can do. The short answer is, uh, with the CapEx efficiency, you could lower carbon emissions substantially. Great. And Joe, the next question, uh -oh. <coughs> this just failed on me. Let me see if I can get back to the questions. Um, so while <laughs> while Excuse me. Back up. Um, <laughs> yeah. Joe, the, the question I saw before this crashed was, um, can you talk a little bit more about how your proposal uh, compares with the whole range of carbon capture solutions that have been developed thus far in the context of electric power plants? So, <clears throat> so as a biologist um, uh, in a world of engineers, this is actually a, a quite a different approach than some of the more mechanical approaches that are currently employed and under development within the, the agency and across other agencies. Um, what we're looking at here is a biological system that first and foremost has significant scale, so it has uh, ability to have a transformational impact on a global, global perspective. Um, also, from a, bio, from a biology standpoint, there are a number of benefits that go with increasing um, plant efficiency and extracting CO2 from the atmosphere and putting that into soil carbon that <clears throat> actually allows us to do this because the economic benefits uh, uh, basically go to the end use, or to the forestry or agricultural or, uh, or rangeland uh, perspective because as we increase soil carbon, uh, we're increasing land values, we're increasing productivity on that, on that particular land, we increase its water holding capacity, we increase its nutrient cycling. So there are a number of other, other benefits that are very compelling uh, within that uh, entire biological system. Great. Paul, the next question is directed to you, and it, it says, "I've heard that solid-state batteries is a, I've heard of solid-state batteries as a potential beyond lithium-ion battery technology. Do solid-ion conductor, conductors play a role in solid-state batteries as well?" Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, there's been a fair amount of press in the last five years or so on solid-state batteries. So a battery that instead of having a liquid electrolyte. Um, which is often a part of the battery, which is also um, subject to uh, catching fire. You might have seen lithium ion battery fires. Um, people are thinking about how to replace it and make it completely solid state. And so solid ion conductors, including that lithium conducting material that I showed in my last slide, would fit directly into that scheme. Great. Um, I've got one question for me, which I'll go ahead and answer. And the question was, uh, in your competition, who would build data sets? And how do you evaluate the quality of data sets? I, I think my answer to that is that it's never been considered a reasonable research question for how you actually build data sets. And there's actually an art to building the data set and the validation of that data set. And so I would see it as us actually um, putting a competitive solicitation out there, perhaps, and asking teams, you know, with a partner, perhaps it's a partner utility or ISO, think about how do you build a large scale data set and then convince the rest of the world through some level of statistical measures or, um, you know, industry advisor approval to convince people that it's actually real. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Sure, so this is the compressed natural gas question. Uh, the question is, you know, will you have adoption of this fuel system given the high pressures and the, and the perception of increased risk? Um, there are a lot of ways to answer that question. Compressed natural gas is being done right now uh, in a pretty big kind of way. Uh, you can always make tanks safer. Uh, I, I think the consensus is that they're safe enough already. Uh, certainly people are worried, but there are a lot of standards out there on how tanks are designed and manufactured. 
very recently, there was a tank explosion. It was a garbage truck. Um, very rarely happens. It happens rarely enough that it makes the news when it happens. And when it does, it's kind of spectacular. Uh, but you know, the, the point is that if there's a payback, a two, three year payback, um, reaching ex industry acceptable safety standards, it'll happen. Right? And those industry acceptable safety standards are actually pretty high. It's a pretty safe industry. Sonia, I've got one question for you regarding uh, net, load <coughs> character, net load characteristics. Um, can you talk a little bit about how quality of service to customers um, might, may or may not be impacted by the proposal you've set forth? That's actually a very good question. That's something that we are very concerned about. Uh, I did not get to talk about it, but one of the challenges we are seeing is that we would like to use flexibility in a load specifically in a manner not to affect quality of service too much. Because typically, demand response programs that we have right now, they turn on or off certain loads. Whereas there's lots of capability in certain uh, types of loads where you can, for example, slow down uh, fans uh, in, in an HVAC system. <coughs> and people will not notice that. You can move uh, set points in HVAC uh, degree or two. And if you do that in aggregate fashion, that can provide an effect <coughs> for a grid. Uh, in terms of reduced consumption and will not be affecting quality of service to that extent. Great. Keep the questions coming. We're having a, a number of them come in now. So um, uh, the next question goes to Joe again. Joe, what's the time scale of sequestration in plants and soil? Would doubling carbon capture with plants simply double the annual swing or is it actually a, a change in net capture? <clears throat> Excellent question and actually um, it's one that we will actually be looking for significant feedback from the um, general community as we go through our, our due diligence. But we're looking at right now, uh, simplistically, at this particular point uh, in the program, that the objective is, is going to have a span multiple time frames, uh, near, mid, and, and long term. Uh, the metric is put out there as an aspirational metric. Um, as I stated it in the uh, presentation, which was on, on an annual basis. But when we look at a complex biological system, uh, we would be uh, cognizant of the fact that we'd be looking at multiple time horizons. Great. Um, Jason, another question to you. Um, your math around your, your truck proposal, um, did it include the capital cost and or O&M costs of the vehicle fleet in comparison to conventional fleets? So th this was kind of hidden in the way that I discussed the payback. There are a lot of ways to talk about this. But basically, um, I assumed that the truck can pay back on vehicle economics alone. So what does that mean? I mean, the, the tanks are going to cost a lot. If you want you know, 600 mile range of CNG tanks on a, on a large truck, you're going to need to pay 80 grand or something like that. The hybridization is going to cost a lot. Uh, so, so the payback is really based off of increased fuel efficiency and a decrease in fuel consumption, uh, or sorry, fuel price uh, compared to diesel. So when diesel prices are high, natural gas is almost always very cheap. When diesel prices are high, you get a, a large payback uh, for these types of systems. So the idea is for deployment is that uh, you know the the condition the diesel price would be high enough such that a natural gas hybrid tractor if we invest in the appropriate technologies, would break into the market on its own without generating electricity, without trying to plug them in, all that stuff. It's just a better choice for the trucking industry. And 10 years from now, uh, when all the trucks that are being operated today are dead and we've built new trucks, we'd have 3 million natural gas hybrid tractors. And 10 years from now, someone says, oh, we need more electricity generation somewhere. And somebody's going to say, hey, we just plug those trucks in. We can get it for 3 cents as opposed to building a new power plant. And so I think the only way for this to work is to make it a good vehicle first and then worry about the electricity afterwards. Joe, another question for you. Um, if you're successful uh, with the proposal, do you envision that carbon capture solutions being applied in nature or in production or both? For you, Joe. Um, I guess that I guess I've I've not quite thought about that particular question, which is uh, why this that particular session is so exciting uh, for us. But in in that particular context, it depends on uh, how we're defining you know those different para different parameters. 
uh, I think there are a number of different ways that we can take the program, and um, I guess I'd need to talk with the person who asked that question. <clears throat> Jason, one more for you. Um, why utilize cars versus just having generators for people's homes that are designed to run at a more steady state on natural gas? So that, that's a distributed generation question, okay? So why don't we all just buy a one kilowatt or two kilowatt generator and run it on natural gas that's piped to our 60, 70 million homes? Uh, RBA actually has a program in that area. Uh, I think that uh, there, there could be a future there. The big difference is that you have to buy the generator. And so, you know, the, that's all about capital costs. It's trying to get cost per kilowatt of the generator down to an affordable level. The marginal cost of that electricity is tiny. It's the, it's the same, you know, well, it's four or five cents because you're paying uh, residential prices for the natural gas. Um, so really, if you use a vehicle, you've already bought the engine. It's sitting there. Uh, and it's just a question of plugging it in. So smaller capex. So we only have about five minutes left. So if you have any burning questions, please do send it in. Um, I've got a question for Sonia. Sonia, you mentioned during, during your proposal um, coordination. And can you talk a little bit about what your vision is regarding how to balance between distributed systems and coordination portions in the control? Oh, this is what I was alluding when I was talking about the architectures, because uh, we have done some preliminary studies and based on projection, it looks like a vision of completely decentralized grid is still far away. We cannot cover all the load with uh, all the local generation. So we have to keep grid in some form or fashion. And then how are we gonna coordinate large bulk uh, power plants with the uh, load and we you know, also distributed generation and hopefully storage when it gets, technology when it gets cheaper. That will have to be put in a context of what we care most about. Right now, we are running grid mainly to keep reliability at certain level. Are we fine with going to a scenario where we don't care about reliability that much? We care more perhaps about resiliency than more distributed architectures are the ones that are uh, candidate architectures. And if we go that way, then coordination is critical. Basically, you have to manage uh, demand, storage, and power generation in different ways. And the, our idea is to look first, how can we actually integrate all these uh, devices into a grid to provide service to a grid and then do sort of uh, organic growth from there. Right now, there is a hidden, uh, basically, uh, phenomena that is going on that some of distributed devices are not fielded due to the limitations that reliability of the grid is imposing on how grid is being run. So hopefully some of this Coordination will help with, with that. Great. Um, I have a question that was, I believe, directed at me on grid optimization. And the question is, um, which do I expect would have a larger impact, hardware or algorithms? And um, quite honestly, you won't find me coming down on either side of that. I think that both have an immense number of benefits. Uh, you know, hardware, you, you need the actuators to actually give you the control. Um, hardware alone can definitely solve local problems that you're having. Um, but you also need the software to fully coordinate them. And so we've funded both at RPE, and I think our role is to um, build a portfolio of potential solutions that are in your toolkit, and then whichever ones you happen to pull out for an individual region or individual grid um, will be best for that situation. So we're, we're uh, very much on, on both sides. Jason, we've got another question here. Right. Um, plugging in three million trucks and operating them to dispatch electric power would be a massive infrastructure challenge. How do you imagine solving that problem? Yeah, that's a uh, tough question. So this kind of alludes to what I was saying earlier. I, I think uh, in, as far as the chicken or the egg, the, the trucks have to exist first. That's why uh, you know, we, I, I would concentrate my efforts on developing truck technologies that make natural gas hybrid trucks economical. Um, I don't think you could justify you know, building a plug-in station, turning a truck stop into a five megawatt generating station. Uh, so doing all that in concert with developing the trucks and the hybrid system and the tank, and all, it's just too much at once. So I would see it as the trucks first, uh, and then as they exist on their own in the trucking industry, then figuring out how to use them for electricity. Great. Um, Joe, have you thought at all about synergy opportunities for carbon sequestration alongside algae, wastewater treatment, and or biofuels production? Obviously, you know, when we're talking about 
plant systems, there would be some synergy as it relates to developing tools and technologies that could potentially transfer uh, across those. Um, at this point in time, we've been focusing on, on uh, terrestrial systems that we think would have the greatest near-term commercial application and also where there's a, a, a defined infrastructure for us to actually deploy those technologies. <laughs> <clears throat> I think we've got time for just one more question. And uh, Jason, I think the last question goes to you. Um, is there an issue that trucks tend to drive at peak power consuming hours? Maybe you're looking at one to two driving break breaks versus 10 hour stretches where they're plugged in. Yeah, so actually there, I don't have any good data on this. Um, th there are a significant number of truckers that drive at night to avoid traffic and park during the day so they, they could handle daytime peaks. Um, there's an argument to be made that 50 years from now when we haven't built any more power plants, the trucks could provide our base load at night and solar could provide daytime peaking. And so it, it, it's a very complicated uh, question and I think uh, it, the future would tell, right? Uh, it, it, it's all a question of economics. Um, truck, truckers have to be good <coughs> at delivering goods. Uh, that's their main job and so they're not going to let that business uh, um, kind of flounder because they're trying to plug into the grid at different times. And so um, I think I would, I would leave that answer to the future. Great. And I think we will pull the session to a close there to allow for time for individual discussions and Q&A. Uh, please join me in thanking my colleagues. Thank you.